I'll start. Well, well, I was born in 1937 uh, in Blackheath, which is a part of London, but my father was very smart. He knew the war was coming, and so he, he bef before the war, we, were, uh, we moved to the south coast of England, Worthing, and, um, and that's where I spent the war, and one year after the war, uh, so my memories, my earliest childhood memories are of wartime in, in, on the south coast where we could watch dogfights, the, uh, the bombers going over. There was a lot of, we saw a lot of action there even though we were never invaded, but the whole of the beach, all of the, was, was barbed wired and, and we were expecting an invasion and then the, bombs going over, the doodlebugs, the flying bombs that were going towards London. We could see, hear them and see them. Uh, so, it, yeah. And us kids, we, we used to do aircraft spotting. I knew every German <coughs> aircraft you could name because we learned the silhouettes and, and, uh, and that. So, um, so it, it was an exciting time in many ways to be a, to be a kid. Um, we met Americans, we met Canadian troops there and, and, uh, and that. But um, because I, I, for some reason I got interested in, in the young farmers. In England there's something, something like 4-H, I don't know what it is in Quebec, but it's uh, pour les jeunes uh, fermiers, you know, the young, the, the, for the youth to, um, to get interested in farming. And so we used to go off on the weekends and um, judge cattle and do all those kind of things related to farm. And, and also in the hills, we would pick berries. It, you couldn't get any fruit in those years. And so we would pick uh, wild rose hips which you could get vitamin C from, and we'd, the government had this plan to, to and so I, I used to get a teaspoon of vitamin C every, uh, um, rose hip syrup at school every day. <laughs> that kind, kind, of, kind of thing. The, then we, um, my father finally was demobbed. My father worked, was, was actually a, um, was in the first war where he was, blown up on a, on a mine, and so all the time I knew him, he wore a hearing aid, his legs were all scarred with, with uh, <coughs> injuries, but he was a very um, healthy and upstanding, and, and both he and my mother were, were converts to vegetarianism, and also sort of nature cure and that, so I never had any childhood inoculations, we never ate meat, uh, or uh, and and I was extraordinarily healthy as a kid. I never, in fact, the one thing they could find, I wasn't very good at school, but I had excellent attendance. I never missed a day. <laughs> but um, so we moved to London. My father had a garage. He was an automobile mechanic. He had previously started a enterprise with his brother selling Ford cars, and then he started off on his own after the war with this, um, uh, he was a repair, he did automobile repairs and, and that. And uh, I went to a school that was so beautiful, the, the, the school grounds backed onto a common, what is an open ground, public land. We, London has huge areas, uh, you know, Roehampton, Park, uh, Richmond Park, uh, all these parks, and we were, so we could play all day, uh, you know, in our, uh, after school and, and in, in the break, in the, in the trees and the woods and, and that. It, even though we were in the middle of London, it was amazing. So, um, 
my father, after he sold, our, our family fortunes improved very much. He sold his business and we moved to a much better, nicer house. They were very middle class, very, you know, um, loyal to the Queen and Winston Churchill and all of that. I found myself becoming separated from my parents over issues like class. They, they hated the working class, you know, they, or they thought, you know, they always were. Whereas I, at school, it, I went to a very good, good school uh, in England. My father had gone to that school. Both of my brothers went. It was uh, competitive to get into that school. Uh, although I was a bad scholar, um, I did manage to get in. And, and, and that school was, was um, uh, very liberating for me. They had a, 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 an amazing, it, it was kind of intended as a training ground to Oxford. Most of the masters there had master's degrees from Oxford University and, and that sort of thing. I was terrible, but I hang out with the working class kids and we used to take time off and, and, and that. I was a, I was a, uh, uh, and I was at home, I was argumentative. I, uh, we, I would fight with my brothers and sister and I always knew I was right, but I always felt that I could never convince anybody that people didn't understand what I was trying to say. So, um, so that um, I, I also um, took up a liking for jazz at, at the end of my school years and, and uh, started to hang out in, in jazz clubs around London and, and that sort of thing. But it was still farming that was my interest. Whenever I had been asked as a young child, what do you want to be when you grow up? I always said a farmer. And so we had no family connections to farming. So I was sent off to a training school that was actually intended for problem kids from the East End of London who were being sent off to be farm workers uh, to get them out of trouble. I wasn't <laughs> that kind of kid. I mean, I wasn't that good, but I wasn't that bad. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, so I got a bit of training in farming and had a couple of jobs for one year in British farms in, in south, of, south of England and realized that the class difference between the landowners and the workers was so great, it, it, it didn't, suit me and I thought emigrating uh, and so I looked at Australia, New Zealand, Canada and Canada seemed to be more open, more more opportunities and, and that sort of thing but um, because I had a dairy farm background uh, I was sent, uh, I, there was an agency, a YMCA agency that found positions for people wanting to emigrate. I was only 16, 17 years old. I was a draft dodger because um, if I'd stayed in, in England, I would have had to have two years in the army. And although my brothers and my father were very military oriented, uh, I, hated, <laughs> I hated the idea of that, that kind of thing. So I, I came to Canada both as a, as, I say, as a high school dropout and a, and a draft dodger. <laughs> but worked on a dairy farm. Instead of you know, going to the Great West or some place where I could homestead, I was, because I had a dairy farm background, I was sent to a farm just outside of metropolitan Toronto. A little village that's now been absorbed into Toronto. It's all concrete, but in those days it was a um, uh, little 100 acre, 150 acre farms, uh, and and we were a dairy farm, uh, Holsteins and that. And I worked there for a year. Again, I was paid 45 dollars a month, and my and my board. You know, I was working for nothing. Even in those days, I mean, forty-five dollars was was worth more then. But but still, it was it was. So I realized this, and um, 
so I, after I was under contract for a year, so after a year I moved into Toronto, got a whatever job I could get, which was a plumber's helper. But I met a guy in the, in the boarding house I lived in who was training to be a meteorological technician to work in the Arctic. And that interested me. And they said, you could get in. And so they trained me for six months, three months at Moulton Airport uh, was there in, in weather observing, and three months on Toronto Island sending up weather balloons because I was trained to be a what's called a radio sound technician, sending up these big hydrogen balloons with, with transmitters that would send weather information from the upper atmosphere. So that was an amazing decision. I, my first posting was at Inukjuak, then called Port Harrison. Uh, we came up to Moose Factory on by train and then got on a, a plane and landed on a Canso flying boat. The doors open and here were all these kayaks, Inuit, paddling around and, 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 you know, I was suddenly thrown into this very traditional um, world of the Inuit. Uh, we there as, as white people, there was a radio station, there was the RCMP, there was the um, uh, Anglican Church, um, and there was our radio sound station, but apart from that, um, it, it was a hunting and seal hunting and uh, completely self, and, and so I was so privileged to be able to not just observe in 19, that was from 1957 to 59, I was in the Arctic uh, working on weather stations. Um, and it also, it did many things for me. I had the time to do correspondence courses. So I, I, I came to Canada without high school graduation, but I picked up courses by correspondence. I started to read for pleasure. Actually, the, uh, the first book I remember reading was Simone de Beauvoir's The Mandarins in English, but you know, it was, um, uh, you know, and, and, and also there was a lot of northern literature, explore, exploration about the Arctic and all of that. They, they had good libraries there and, and so I, and uh, I, I really liked Inukjuak, um, although I saw racism and the RCM, you know, I saw some things that disturbed me about how the Inuit were being treated by some people. The, the Hudson Bay Company, on the other hand, uh, uh, I, I felt was, I got a very favorable impression of their dealings with the, with the Inuit. The RCMP and the other agencies, less, less so. And then a, an anthropologist showed up, um, Bill Wilmot, a, um, a McGill anthropologist under, with, working with, um, with um, uh, oh, what's his name, um, uh, Belixi, S.N. Belixi, um, who was, I think, working at Great Whale River at that time, but, but anyway. And I argued, Bill and I became um, quite close during that summer he was there and I watched his research and, and but we used to argue and fight like cats and dogs. I, I still had some very right wing views, I think at that time that I thought people, uh, anyway, uh, Bill and, but we, we remained great friends and we've actually, intersected our lives at several other points later on. But um, so you could say that was an influence, but really I was also interested in electronics. I've been, a, partly from my father's teachings as an engineer, he was, he was an inventor, he was a very um, clever, <coughs> clever engineer. And so I've always been good with my hands electronics, I'd take things apart and sometimes I could put them back together again and that sort of thing. But 
Um, in the Arctic, I was, my job was, was involved radio signals and we would use the tracking devices, but I knew that I was an employee of the Department of Transport and radar for airports was coming in then. It was just starting. And so I, I planned to train myself as a radar technician. And so three years after living in the Arctic, all the money I was earning had gone into the bank. You don't spend a penny up there. Everything is supplied and, and that. And I mean, I, you know, I could go on a great length about the incredible experiences with the natural environment there. You, you, you've spent time in the Arctic, you know, the, the, the amazing um, uh, phenomena. And, and also because I, this um, job I worked at, radio sound technician, we did two releases a day at, at, at um, 12, 00 and 1200 um, universal time. And they, each flight took, depending, it depended on, on conditions, may last up to two or three hours, but that was it, once you'd done that. So we used to be able to make arrangements with it. You only, supposed, you only needed to do one shift a day, but you could easily manage two shifts a day and release your friend for, who could go off for a few weeks with the Inuit. And so I would go off to the flow edge, I would go uh, fox um, uh, trapping, you know, with, with the Inuit and, and that is amazing uh, experiences that, that, that I, I had, uh, you know, living in, in the Arctic. So anyway, here I am deciding what to do. I had enough money, I had plenty of money. I had, um, uh, now I had my high school graduation and I rode away for a few universities and was accepted at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. But I thought I was gonna be an engineer then, <laughs> so I went into pre-engineering as a requirement if I was to go into electronic uh, engineer. And Quite frankly, I passed my year, but only just. And the math and chemistry and that, I never felt comfortable. And, and, and so, and in those days, you didn't need to be slotted into some major program. So after that, in my second, third, uh, third years, I took whatever I happened, I took, philosophy was probably the most important discipline I took and, and I got very interested in, in uh, Wittgenstein and all of these, the, 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 the topics, uh, you know, that. Um, I did a lot of English uh, literature and, and that. Geography uh, was, was a, an interesting subject. And really only in the final year did I take any anthropology courses. Um, one factor was Bill Wilmot showed up as professor there, and so. Uh, but Harry Hawthorne was the head of the department, and and there was a lot of interesting stuff going on in the department um, around that time. Uh, I don't know exactly. You know, Hawthorne had the the um, the huge Indian Affairs project on on the state of. Aboriginal people and Indians. I don't think it dealt with the Inuit. It was just an Indian Affairs sponsored research program. Eric did some, Eric Schwimmer was a graduate student. <coughs> he come from New Zealand there and that's how I, and, and we became good friends. I used to hang out with him and his wife Ziska, um, other people that I knew then, Gordon, Gordon Inglis, um, and uh, gra other graduate students that were quite influential on me. Um, I had a very good friend, Ross Clark, who was a linguist. Um, so uh, it, it was a very exciting, but it was the 60s. You know, I got there in September 59. Um, and I think in particular, University of British Columbia felt because they were on the other side of the mountains, they had to bring people. So we were constantly getting high profile visitors, Marshall McLuhan, um, uh, all of these uh, 
you know, so uh, plus through jazz, through art, through poetry, I mean, my whole world was being, being <laughs> totally opened up by those four years of undergraduate work where I wasn't a particularly serious student in any one discipline. <laughs> you know, I did enough to get by with my courses. I wasn't a, um, but had an amazing, amazing experience. I was part owner of a jazz club but by then and knew a lot of jazz musicians. I couldn't play, uh, I tried, but, but I never have developed uh, a talent for play, but I've always remained hanging out with musicians and <laughs> enjoying the, the, uh, the, um, the, the world of mu musicians and, and that. So, um, oh, I took a course in sociology from a professor, Werner Cohen, on the sociology of religion. And that was, we were invited to do field work in a, with a, with a religious group with whom we had no previous experience. <clears throat> and in Vancouver at the time, there was a sect called the Father Divine sect. Father Divine was a black pre preacher or black god, they call it, living in Harlem. Um, and during the Depression and the Second World War, he'd been amazingly successful in basically getting jobs for his followers. They lived in these secluded residences where no sexual relations were permitted. It was um, to, um, both, both mainly men, but, but also women. It was, a, anyway, they had a chapter in, in um, Vancouver. They just met every week. It, one of the claims of Father Divine was he could magically create food, endless amounts of food out of, and so we'd have these, um, um, feasts every week. I, and I started to attend regularly to, and hear the, and they would play tapes of, um, of sermons, you might say, of Father Divine, this, this uh, black preacher, uh, that, who, you know, was God, and who, he had the whole of New York worried because he would curse things and then they would happen. And you know, he, he, had, he, he was credited with having enormous powers. And, and so, you know, this is fast. So, uh, so I wrote this report for Werner Cohn on, on that. And anyway, the, the whole, I, I realized that that kind of exotic field work really suited me. Um, so, um, so so uh, I must have been in my final year uh, when I was getting my bachelor's that um, a man named Jim Lotz, who was um, working with the Northern Coordination and Research Center, part of Indian Affairs at the time, had something called the Yukon Research Project. There was a lot of research going on in the Arctic with Indian Affairs at that time. Uh, I don't know if you knew Moose Kerr. He was the head of that um, uh, th that body, and he was very, you know, for Indian Affairs, he was quite enlightened <laughs> and 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 a lot of interesting research. Peter Asher, um, Hugh Brody, got, all, these guys got their start working with that um, outfit. I w I was asked to do a small project, a summer project, um, on the use of wildlife in the Yukon, which meant by not only by indigenous people for their own food, but also a lot of um, trophy hunting uh, and guiding uh, trophy hunters. The Yukon at the time had a reputation among Americans and, and that, that kind of thing. Um, so, so I did a, um, did a project, uh, wrote a report, you know, traveled in all, all parts of the Yukon, was appalled at the, at the terrible state of the Aboriginal people um, uh, whose hunting way of life was systematically being, um, being taken from them and 
many were moving into into ghettos like like um, whiskey flats in 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 Whitehorse and and that kind of thing. So anyway, I uh, I resolved I wanted to come back and do further research.